thrilled to have John Nance uh, addressing medical accidents and his concept, the red cover report. Uh, and uh, I am going to move briskly through slides uh, because John is covering uh, the Malaysian air accident or uh, the lot with the loss of an entire aircraft. But I wanted to just uh, remind you I'm on slide three. Go to your lower left-hand corner if you're getting bad audio. And John has uh, got a great audio line this time around, and uh, we're thrilled uh, with the good audio quality. But if you have bad audio quality, go to the lower left-hand corner of your screen and click the icon for the telephone so we can give you a line. Uh, if you want to uh, uh, get the, the uh, slides, which you may not have, go to uh, www.safetyleaders.org. Go up in the What's New uh, menu, and you'll see our webinar. And that will take you to the page I have on slide five with the picture of John. Uh, and there you can download the resources that tie to this uh, uh, webinar. And that includes the article that uh, Dennis Quaid, John Nance, uh, Sully Sullenberger, and, and I wrote uh, that addresses the NTSB for healthcare. On slide six, remind you we're on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, and on slide seven, our calling to save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. Uh, we've recently crafted a new purpose uh, which uh, ties to this, and that is that uh, we will measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families. Our disclosure statement is too long to read. It is on slide eight. Uh, and uh, no product, service, or technology will be addressed in this uh, webinar. And there are no commercial uh, uh, features to it whatsoever. Uh, on slide nine, uh, our disclosure statement as well. Uh, and then on slide 10, uh, uh, we have uh, the AHRQ um, uh, slide, uh, Kyle, that addresses the comparative database. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, that probably will be out of order. We'll uh, change the PDF uh, to make it fit. Uh, our speakers and our reactors on slide 12 are John Nance. Uh, we all know John to be an uh, enormously talented uh, uh, individual. He was one of the founders of the National Patient Safety Foundation, a best-selling author, lawyer, uh, former captain with one of our major airlines, the current safety ABC broadcaster. He's got two best-selling uh, books, very recent, many best-selling books, but two uh, that are written as uh, novels that really help us understand culture. We have uh, Dan Ford, Becky Martins, Mary Foley, Jennifer Dingman, all as reactors uh, who will help us uh, uh, really react to John's presentation. And uh, Dan Ford will be going uh, first uh, uh, and just give us a short 20 to 30 second inspirational uh, game setting uh, comment. But we'll come back to Dan to address a recent uh, article of his and the area, the great area of passion that Dan has uh, for including patients and families in uh, the reports uh, after an accident. So uh, uh, Dan, would you please open us? And then we'll come back to you again during the reactor period. Sure, I'd be pleased to. I, I really appreciate uh, being invited again, uh, Chuck. I'm honored to be here. Um, I want to welcome each of you that is listening and, and watching uh, and hope that, is, that you uh, have some wonderful takeaways from this. I was honored uh, uh, in June to be in Telluride, Colorado with John as one of the faculty members. He was one of the major speakers at the uh, patient safety workshop uh, that was held there. Uh, just a few words uh, about John. You could say a lot of them, but John is very pragmatic. He's very realistic. He's courageous, he's insightful, he's far-sighted, he's charismatic, he's compelling when appropriate. He's got a wonderful sense of humor. And he's got a way of engaging an audience, uh, mesmerizing at times, and, and just a wonderful and gifted speaker. Look forward to it, John. Thank you, Dan. Well, thank you very much, Dan. And we'll come back to Dan's uh, presentation. Dan will really address uh, for a few minutes during the reactor panel uh, the, this article, uh, Case in Point. And there's a photograph of him at the recent uh, uh, Telluride, Telluride meeting. Uh, I'm going to keep my comments uh, really uh, 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 short here. Uh, and we'll come back to them in the reactor panel as well. But some highlights are the Mayo Proceedings article we addressed in last session uh, regarding second opinions. 
the article in Modern Healthcare regarding the uh, the gaps in our rating systems, and we'll remind you. The other thing is is that the Consumers Union on slide 19 uh, 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 helped catalyze a subcommittee hearing of more than a thousand preventable deaths a day. We just watched it; it's terrific. Uh, it really addresses the issue that John will be covering today, and we will we will make a link to that recording available to you as well as a transcript. To set up John, uh, John is uh, uh, his the essence of his passion is communicated in our uh, documentary "Surfing the Healthcare Tsunami," where we applied aviation and leadership principles to board issues. And both he and Sully Sullenberger, Dennis Quaid, and the Blue Angels were all in that. Uh, we wrote the article: an NTSB for healthcare, learning from AV innovation, debate and innovate, or capitulate. And we really articulated John's description of what he described as a red cover report, which is what we envision to be something like we have as pilots, the blue cover report. On slide 23, John and I in Austin, Texas, a couple of years ago, put this up on a 60 by 70 foot screen in the, in the major uh, 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 entertainment center in Austin, Texas, in front of an audience of 700 people, and we basically spoofed them and uh, put up this icon as if there was a National Health Care Safety Board and, and asked them to raise their hands if they thought we, it should be continued to be funded. And, and this spoofed them in that they thought that it existed. And this audience was an audience of administrators uh, and healthcare leaders who didn't even know we didn't have such an entity. So uh, John will now uh, 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 go ahead uh, uh, forward. Uh, and John, you've got the, you've got the ball. Thanks very much, Chuck, and uh, Dan, thanks for the gracious uh, uh, introduction. A little bit too much. Uh, I'm not that uh, all pulled together on everything, but I appreciate it very much. Uh, yeah, that Austin thing was funny, because afterwards, not only did we pull their leg, but people were saying, you mean there's not one? We, we, we don't have a National Health Care Safety Board, and there was confusion. Uh, let, let me get to the basic of this, or the basis, if you will. Um, and let me lay the foundation. Unlike aviation, unlike nuclear power, we do not in healthcare learn from our mistakes and disasters in time. Uh, you've heard the term 17 years to inculcate anything new. It may be 10 years, but one year is too long. Even 30 days is too long. In aviation, and I'm not going to hold this up as a major paradigm uh, on everything by any means because we're not as complex as medicine, but in aviation, we have the ability to learn from our mistakes almost instantaneously. And one of the reasons is because every accident that occurs gets taken apart in ways that get the lessons from all the different elements of the causal chain. And that's one of the very important points is that there is a causal chain. There's never just one reason for an accident or an incident or a near miss, whether it's in aviation, nuclear power, or medicine. Part of the reason that we don't learn from our mistakes in medicine is the veil of secrecy and shame and fear which suppresses information. Part of it is the lack of a method for probing disasters and near disasters and then disseminating vital information about what works and what kills. Uh, we don't have a method. And part of it is the ability of courts to lock cynically vital or clinically vital information away in a cynical fashion, quite frankly, and sealed records and the uh, full participation of the rest of the industry in, in doing that and locking away things that we need to know right now. The third problem, the part of, uh, of sealing records, is going to take an enlightened Congress, and we have anything but that right now. But the first and the second problem can be immediately interdicted by creating a national level body of complete neutrality, political untouchability, if there's such a word, and one dedicated to the gathering, analyzing, and utilizing of the lessons already learned. And that's why we proposed a National Health Care Safety Board. And we could call it a, a whole bunch of different things, but uh, the basic idea is to have an organization not as a rule maker, not a substitute for the Joint Commission, not a regulatory body, but an institution dedicated to the proposition that medicine should learn lessons the very first time, not continue to kill, injure, and harm patients for decades before realizing problems exist. And we all know this is true. If you'll hark back to one of the early uh, uh, number one items on the hit list of the Joint Commission, getting rid of, uh, of uh, uh, undiluted KCL, uh, potassium chloride, in order to prevent people from accidentally injecting undiluted potassium chloride and stopping a heart when that wasn't the intention. Uh, we still have institutions that haven't taken that off yet. But the main thing is the evidence took so long to filter out of various cases and closed claim files 
that really we were killing people in a wholesale fashion with this before anybody took action. And there are just countless examples of things that need to be done right now, if not yesterday, but we don't know about them. Well, let me tell you a little bit about the NTSB, because that is kind of the profile or the template, if you will, for them taking a look at us and saying we need some sort of the equivalent. NTSB is the National Transportation Safety Board. They don't just investigate aerial accidents. They investigate pipelines, uh, highway transportation, a, a, a wide amount of, uh, or a wide array, I should say, of the things that, uh, that we rely on in North America. Uh, they have a degree of independence that very few federal agencies have. Uh, they're not totally devoid of political influence, but they are heavily insulated. It's a board of five members and a staff of over 390 people. Most of them are experts. They're PhDs throughout the uh, complex. And their ethos, if you will, their ethic and the reason for their existence is to find everything that they need to find out and, and analyze it to make sure that no accident is repeated for the same causes. It is basically a matter of getting rid of the idea of blame and simply saying we need to know everything that happened, everything that contributed, so we can make it not happen again. One of the reasons that we are so safe these days and in aviation, we have a spectacular record, even given what just happened a few hours ago. Uh, we have done that not because we're smarter, but because we learned over and over and over again what was not working, what was making a difference, and we put that together. Uh, most spectacularly, of course, in the 80s, we put it together in terms of understanding that we had to, we had to get to the heart of human failure. We had to understand why humans, human beings failed in order to be able to interdict those failures. Uh, the NTSB has been a spectacular success and has contributed worldwide to a, uh, a massive improvement in aviation safety. And uh, to give you an example of how dramatic that is, uh, while we kill 440,000 Americans every year, according to Dr. John James' paper from last September, uh, from a combination of nosocomial infections and medical mistake, and hurt, according to him, one order of magnitude greater, which would be 4 million every year, by the way, that's the equivalent of crashing three 747s per day and losing everybody aboard. In aviation, we went from the loss of American 587 in Queens, New York, uh, about six weeks after 9-11. That was an accident that had nothing to do with terrorism. It was a mechanical and a, a, about oh, five or six different major causes. Uh, we went 12 years before losing another major airframe in the United States. I never thought we could even go a year. I used to tell our people at ABC, we don't want to talk about this because it's anomalous. After about three or four years, I realized, wait a minute, something profound has happened here. And what was profound was that we had finally learned how to stop human failures by a combination of teamwork and communication. And that would not have happened had we not had a body that diligently and without political influence was able to constantly go in and say, here are all the contributing factors in whatever has happened. Now, there, the point here is that there is absolutely no reason why that can't transfer uh, to health care. Now, there are some caveats. First of all, the political independence has to be there. Secondly, it cannot be, as I said, a joint commission or a regulatory body whether it would ever have standby, snap-on regulatory authority is a question for another time. The NTSB doesn't even have that. They have to cajole and beg and plead sometimes to get the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, to move. But how would an NHSB function? Well, first of all, it would not investigate all medical accidents. That would be virtually impossible. What it would do, especially in the first number of years of spin-up, in my view, is to take a look at the most representative incidents and accidents that kill, harm, and hurt uh, across the nation. In other words, everything from wrong site surgeries to uh, uh, the infection problems of nosocomial infections, uh, all the way through failure to identify the proper uh, malady and, uh, and unnecessary surgeries as well. They would take a look at each of these areas, prioritize what to attack, and then go get a, as many representative situations as they could. There would have to be some legal impunity, uh, or I should say some legal uh, ability to say, if you talk to us, this cannot be used in any litigation. That's exactly the same as what the NTSB has. And the ability of this board to put together a profile of the most common accidents, incidents, and mistakes could interdict up to 50 to 60 percent of those 440,000 deaths a year within a couple of years, simply by publicizing to all members of healthcare why, if you do A, you're going to get B, 
almost every time, and why it's dangerous to do A and you have to change. Uh, it, it seems so simple, but we don't have a mechanism in healthcare, and we absolutely desperately need one. Uh, information filters down slowly, and it can't be allowed to filter slowly. Again, we can't take 5 or 10 or 15 or 17 years. Why do we need an analysis of disasters and near disasters? Well, because this is a human system, and you cannot improve safety in a human system without understanding it. You can't achieve high reliability without knowing how and why humans and human systems fail. That's exactly what we learned in, in aviation, and it was a it was a tough le lesson. Um, and if I can get the, I don't seem to have a button here. So, uh, Kyle, if you'd advance to the next slide for me. Um, I think I John, see it. it's in the carrot just next to There the we go. Okay. There Perception, go. assumption, and communication. I didn't pre-flight this board. That's what's going on here. Sorry, I didn't reuse my checklist. Uh, this is how we fail as humans. We fail by perception, we fail by assumption, and we fail in communication. Perception, uh, just to give you a quick example from aviation, and everybody has their own example from healthcare, no question about that. Uh, we see things that aren't there and don't see things that are. 1988, Dallas, Boeing 727, Delta Airlines crashed because three qualified, capable, sober pilots, all uh, wanting to get back home in perfectly good shape that night, looked forward and said 1515 green in positioning the flaps, those movable panels on the back of the wing, and in fact, they were zero zero, and there had never been a green light. And they crashed on takeoff and killed 16 people as a result. That was a human error. We make human errors because we are carbon-based human beings. We make assumptions also. And by the way, a quick takeaway for all of you is that if you're ever going to make a clinical assumption that could hurt somebody if that assumption was wrong, you do not have the legal, moral, and ethical right to make that assumption. You must check it out. And too often, we, we run right past that reality. But the big one is communication. It always has been. It, it probably always will be communication, because we as humans think we do a much better job than we actually do. Matter of fact, I think I've used this phrase probably too much. Many of you heard me use it, but I think it's still ap apropos. Uh, have you ever heard the phrase, I know you think you understood what you thought I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And we do this to each other all the time. Anybody who's married understands that. Don Berwick said this a few years ago, and I want to put this on a granite arch someplace. I wish I had the money to do it. Any human system built on the expectation of continuous, perfect human performance has hardwired failure into its structure. Hardwired. And Don's absolutely right. In, in medicine, in all forms of health care, what happens when something goes wrong? We're surprised. We're surprised because we didn't see it coming. We're surprised because we didn't know it happened to 50 or 100 or 1,000 other doctors and nurses in exactly the same procedure because we have no way of telling each other about these things. We absolutely have got to change this paradigm, and I think the quickest way to do it is with a methodology, as I say, involving some sort of an operation that resembles the NTSB. We can call it National Health Care Board. Again, you can call it anything you want to, but we need people who can come out and say, okay, here is what's going on in this particular area, and we must not repeat it. If you do these things, these are the problems that are going to result. Now, by the way, how do we, how do we get this out? to the population? How do we get this to every nurse, every doctor, every hospital, every risk manager? That's where the red cover report comes in, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But there are many different ways. First of all, finding the information, and then secondly, how to disseminate it. Uh, in aviation, by the way, we are not only not perfect, we're anything but. Uh, I always like to show this slide. I don't know how they got this airplane in the tree. Actually, everybody lived. Uh, we have, as I say, in commercial aviation, gotten incredibly good, almost to zero. And by the way, we've got to believe in zero if we're ever going to get there. But uh, the fact is, we are not perfect in aviation. And some of our most spectacular accidents, like this one on March 27th of 1977, before we began to change our paradigm about communication in the cockpit, this was Tenerife. That was the, the worst aviation disaster in, uh, in commercial aviation history. And I hope it will always be that killed uh, an uh, awful lot of people out there on the runway in the island of Tenerife and the Canaries. Uh, human failure in a complex human system is by no means limited to medicine or aviation. I think we all understand that in one level, but in another we don't, because we tend to look at medicine as totally different. Any high-risk enterprise that uses us as carbon-based human beings, and I know carbon-based is an old Star Trek term, but us as human beings, 
is at risk if there is no means of carefully and honestly analyzing accidents, and near misses for that matter. We, we simply cannot continue to whistle through the graveyard here and say that, well, we, we can figure these things out with RCAs. RCAs are not standardized. You remember the Costa Concordia. Uh, we talk about communication and the fact that uh, we have known for a long time that if you've got officers who are concurrently responsible in a hierarchical system on any sort of a dangerous enterprise, which of course a cruise ship would count as, you can come to grief very rapidly with a lot of people aboard, you've got to have levels of communication. We have known this for a long time in the, in the U.S. Navy. They've learned it uh, way, way back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, cruise ships are still struggling with it. So are a lot of aspects of, uh, of uh, the marine industry. But it's certainly in aviation, we had this figured out by 85, and we had our culture completely changed by about 98. On the bridge of that ship that night, there were no fewer than five deck officers, the captain and a first, second, third, and fourth officer. The reason that the first and second officer are being prosecuted criminally along with the captain is they had a concurrent responsibility to just walk over and say, Captain, you're too close to the rocks. They knew it. They all knew it. But nobody could bring themselves to speak up. Why? Because, among other things, there was no knowledge of how many times this had almost brought a ship to grief in the past. There was very little way that they in that industry had communicated. They had the same problem that we do in medicine. And so the, the industry was not aware of the hazards of not speaking up. And certainly in that particular shipping line, that's uh, I'm sure has all changed now. The fact is that one of the greatest contributors of a national health care safety board or the contributions would be to validate and solidify our knowledge of some very important basics, things that we already know but we have not inculcated, including the fact that intimidated people do not pass on vital information. We, we in the first year of operation of any uh, sort of a medical safety board, could easily validate that this is an overwhelming problem and get to the heart immediately of why people don't speak up and what is needed, which is, of course, teamwork and training to be able to be team leaders, which we certainly haven't done with our physicians or our nurses. And we are, uh, we are trying to do this uh, in a backdoor way across the country. A central authority, not again as a regulator, but as an authority of uh, being able to say, this is what happens and this is what you get if you don't uh, follow A, B, and C. Uh, could be incredibly effective just by bringing people together on the point that this is now irrefutable. We know what happens when you don't use good teamwork communication. We know people aren't going to speak up. And we have thousands of close claim files. And we now have more than that. We have the ability to poke through those. This, by the way, is something that I think is very important. We're going to have to change this business of locking up records. But we can do it fairly quickly by having a board like this with a certain degree of legal um, uh, insulation that uh, I, what I envision, and I'm also a lawyer and I know the difficulties of this, but what I envision is uh, the ability to put law in place, probably federally and probably preemptively, that says no record in a case involving medical negligence or medical harm uh, may be sealed until and unless the moving party, the party who has put the uh, request in for sealing, even in a settlement, uh, has paid to extract all the applicable clinical information. We don't need to know the names. We need the clinical information. And that clinical information is hidden, incredibly hidden from us. From 20 years of cases out there would be a very, very rich mining of, uh, of information that could help save lives right now. If we had a board that could be trusted with this process and trusted with this information, it would be a central repository, and, and no one's going to get sued as a result of it. Uh, but I think this has to be congressional action. And to do that, we're going to have to educate a lot of people on Capitol Hill who are too busy trying to kill each other rather than do the country's business. And that's another story. Leaders far too often refuse to believe, by the way, that morale and attitude are important components. but. In my view, they are absolutely vital. Um, I'd love to put this up. And there are t-shirts like this, too. The beatings will continue until morale improves. But you know, there are folks out there, and I think we've all encountered them, as good as they may be in every other aspect, who do not understand this equation. Uh, if you have upset people, and I could go off in a whole hour on this, uh, because we now know it's a direct connection in patient safety to disaster. If you've got somebody upset because of some problem at, at home, something that they're working through, maybe they backed over the dog this morning, you've got somebody who's immediately 
less able to provide the level of safety and the level of quality that we need. That doesn't mean you fire them. It does mean that you have to be aware of them. And being aware of them also means being aware of the realities that upset people, cause accidents and problems. That's something else, that if you had this repository of information, we could get past the theoretical part and get past the part where people say, well, that's touchy-feely, squeezy, uh, California hot tub cycle babble stuff that doesn't apply to us. You know, if it's, if it's known to be a fact and you've got a National Health Care Safety Board that has made it very clear, uh, it's also going to be a legal liability problem to ignore it. And I think that, too, is one of the major functions. Not that uh, the things that a safety board would find out would be usable directly in court, but that they would help set the center line for the best levels of practice that we continually want to debate when, in fact, we need to be just improving. Uh, these, these points are important. This is the USS Nimitz. I'm an Air Force guy, and I shouldn't be talking about the Navy, but this is complimentary because the Navy in 1968 began to find out that the most dangerous spot on the planet, which was the decks of these carriers and aerial operations, were continuing to be dangerous because the folks down there on the deck were not being listened to. And finally, they changed it. They turned it around, and they said, everybody down there, including that brand new 18-year-old who just came aboard the boat yesterday, has a responsibility, not just a license, to raise his or her hand and stop the whole aerial operation if anything's wrong. And they supported them brilliantly. I could tell you a long dissertation about how this all came about. It started with the 7th Fleet. But basically, they improved their safety in six months by 159%, and now it's the way the Navy's been doing business for a long time. If some new kid comes aboard and raises his or her hand and stops the operation, the air boss sends everybody to the beach, so to speak. In other words, they send them to a land-based airport if they can. No one comes running down and grabs that kid by the neck and says, why did you do that? In fact, they throw them a party that night, even if they're wrong. And I'm, I'm asked, you know, what happens if the same kid stops the ship three times in one week? Well, then he's going to meet the captain and get a little, you know, education. But he's also going to get three parties, which are basically just cupcakes with a candle, and his name or her name goes up in lights. They figured this out. And I couldn't say anything about the Navy without at least this little sidebar. The Navy's been saying terrible things about us in the Air Force. They've been saying if we ever got our hands on one of these carriers, we wouldn't know what to do with it, and we'd probably park a B-52 on it. Not true. We know exactly what we do with one of these carriers because the Air Force very much likes golf. I don't know if all of you necessarily remember Pogo. It used to be a very popular comic strip, and I love this one. We have met the enemy, and he is us. Any resistance that we continually mount in, in, the, in the business of trying to get something like this board established or get some central repository of investigatory information that is not necessarily than a hammer but is a font of, of helpful information about what to do and what not to do, we are our own worst enemies. And there really is no, no rationale or reason for, uh, for resisting this. It's not a high-cost item. Our national penchant for hiding the details of bad occurrences is literally at the heart of the problem, and we've got to get past it. Now, how do we do that? I mentioned the red cover report. The blue cover report uh, actually is a, a thing that comes from uh, the National Transportation Safety Board on every aviation accident, every pipeline accident. This is what one of them would look like. It, it can be thin and it can be thick, depending on the details of the accident, but every one of them has a particular protocol it tells you a capsule of what happened in non-emotional terms and non-judgmental terms. It doesn't give you names. It tells you uh, then in an expanded version of the entire sequence of events, everything that contributed, everything that they've been able to find. And then it puts those events in perspective and starts talking about the different causal factors, every link in the causal chain, never just one. Sometimes it's 25 or 30 contributing factors, and that's, what, that's the phrase they use, contributing factors. And then they make recommendations. Now, again, not with respect to one particular problem. Let's say we have a retractor left in the patient, and uh, uh, it wouldn't be a red cover report just based on that, but that's what I would call it as a red cover report, and I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. I thought we had an example of that, and Chuck maybe can tell me about that a little later. We had a mock-up. It's uh, three it's, slides down, John. Three slides down. Okay, well, forgive my flipping around here, but let me show this to you. This is just a mock-up. But the basic idea is you take a look at maybe one spectacular incident, but you're also analyzing the march of incidents that, that uh, prove to a board like this 
that this is a major problem and it continues to repeat over and over and over again. For instance, not using a standard protocol religiously, everybody doing exactly the same thing on uh, central line in insertions and creating central line infections. And we can get to zero on that. We, I think everybody knows this now. Uh, but uh, wrong site surgery is based on failure to mark in a standardized methodology, which gets back to the cottage industry versus a true system. Uh, we're still having a, a problem with even understanding that we were and are a cottage industry. But this type of thing, in this mock-up that you see here, is really the idea of what it would be to issue these, maybe five or six the first year, that are on the most important things that we keep doing wrong and by which we keep hurting people. And the impact, I think, would be tremendous. I, I can tell you, and those of you who are pilots know this, that if, uh, if you throw a blue cover report, a new one, into a pilot's lounge, you best be prepared to jump back because we're all diving on them. We want to know who did something wrong, what happened, what went wrong, how can we avoid it, and we're, we're eager for that information. I don't think there's any difficulty in predicting that that would be precisely the response of the medical community throughout healthcare care uh, to this sort of a report. Again, it's not a perfect mirror image of the National Transportation Safety Board, but in effect, the basic principles can be transferred one to one, and the benefits quite frankly, are not, not only incalculable in my view, but when you've got a scorecard like we've got, 440,000 deaths a year even today, this, this many years after the IOM report thought we were at one quarter of that, we don't have time to quibble. We've got to do something. And this is really a national priority. Chuck? So John, before you, uh, and you're providing continuous updates with uh, uh, ABC on this crash that has occurred in the Ukraine, and so we know that you'll have to split off. Uh, that, yes. but, uh, two quick questions, and then we'll let you go. One of them is, uh, or a statement to have you affirm, we're not saying that a red cover report or that an NTSB for healthcare would study each and every accident and generate a report that just if we had 20 or 25 of the really, really common high impact events that are happening continuously all the time, yes. that could have an enormous impact, number one. And then number two, a side-by-side -side comparison with root cause analysis, these reports would really help us understand the systems, not just assign one cause when it's never one cause. Is that is that correct? That is a precisely correct statement of the, my point of view. And yes, you, there's no way that this would make any sense if you tried to investigate everything. You have to cherry pick the things that are the most important, but literally we could go for 10 years and, and never run out of those things that needed to have been known 5, 10, or 15 years ago. Great. And John, finally, one point which will lead into Dan is the critical nature of having patients and families be involved in these analyses rather than sequestered off in, in the land of risk management never to be heard of again, and then we bury their their families and along with a gag order and never learn. So uh, I, I feel so involving patients and families. Yeah, I feel so strongly about this and, and totally agreeing with what you you just said <clears throat> that I have to kind of restrain my rhetoric from getting too heated at the idea that we continually have this star chamber idea that we, the public need not be involved. We are the public. When our loved ones go into the hospital, we have a different shift in point of view, and that right there is enough to prove that we have no right uh, to keep this stuff sequestered. And it's also incredibly important because a lot of the nuances, and every doctor knows this, every clinician knows this, every nurse knows this, whether they'll admit it or not, you have to have the input and the participation and the full partnership of the patient and the patient's family. And we have to have that if we're going to make not only this idea work, but if we're going to get a hold of this great profession and get it where it ought to be, which is don't do any harm that you don't absolutely have to. How about a member of the board? Excuse final me. statement real quick uh, is that we discussed in our, in our speaker's uh, uh, bullpen um, that what we've done, the elephant in the room is we vilify the victims to protect the flawed systems that pay our paychecks. Is that a fair statement, John? And then we'll let you go. It is, and it's part of the stick your head in the sand and blame anybody else. And it, uh, unfortunately, it's not a matter of bad people, as we all know. It's a matter of a bad systemic methodology that's developed over time in a cottage industry that's having to grow up, and it's very painful in doing that. We'll let you go, but Dan had a quick question. If you have 30 more seconds, go yes, ahead. Go ahead, but if you'd have to go, John, please do. I can take it. Go ahead. 
How about do you see the patient and the family uh, having a role on the board? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. The board itself. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that's inevitable. I mean, it, it's absolutely required because, again, you don't want a priesthood here. The NTSB is not a priesthood. They're very, very uh, thoroughly educated, good people, but they are not silent. And anyone in Washington who wants to, anybody going to Washington, if you want to, give them a call. They'll give you a tour. They're proud of what they do, and they should be. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. Thank and you, and my apologies that. to everybody for having to run, but I've got to get back on the air at ABC. Thank you so much, John. It's always spectacular. And, and the article, John articulates the Red Cover Report, its essence and detail in, a, in our article with Sully Sullenberger. Uh, Dan, would you go ahead and take us from here? I would. And uh, John's got something very serious that he's got to turn his attention to. But as a former naval aviator, I did want to uh, commend his wisdom in, in talking about, the, about naval aviation and the carriers in his presentation. I've heard his presentations before and uh, know that he is, he, is, uh, uh, he, he is a supporter of all of the, uh, all of the armed forces. Uh, on a very serious note, um, Chuck has asked me to talk about the subject of, invite, of inviting patients and families to participate in their own root cause analysis. I have been a very outspoken proponent of this for over 10 years. Um, the um, slide you have in front of you is the first page of an article that I wrote in December uh, that appeared in the um, online uh, version of Case in Point uh, by Dorland Health. This is the case management organization. Um, I don't know that you can go to their website without being a member and, and getting it. I don't know if my um, email address is listed any place, but uh, it is danford904 yeah, at AOL.com. I put it, I, I put right it on the slide okay, over your picture with John. I, by the way, that is John, and then Paul Levy's, uh, Levy is on the right. This picture was taken at Telluride um, last month in June. Um, can we go back to the slide just before that? Um, thank you. Um, I. Back in 1991, I'm just going to give a 30-second summary. Uh, my first wife, Diane, experienced a very serious medical error. She has permanent brain damage and uh, permanent short-term memory loss. And there were several other medical errors that happened uh, during her stay, um, none of which should have happened. Um, I, I started to ask questions. Um, about what happened and got nice and polite answers. And then I was turned over to what I call a senior risk manager. And, uh, and this guy was, uh, was not very pleasant to deal with. He was what I call old school. He was uh, very, very rigid in his thinking. He reminded me that his role was not to give away money. I told him I didn't want to file a lawsuit for us to file one, but, but he said, don't underestimate me. Uh, one of the defining actions for me was when I asked for a copy of the hospital uh, medical record, and I got it for, for $94, you can have it. And, then I, and you can see it on the slide, the third column over. Then I asked for a copy of the report by the hospital committee that reviewed what happened to Diane. I, I said, somebody must have debriefed this. I don't know that we had root cause analyses back that time in 91, 92, 93 uh, time frame. Um, but I asked for a copy of the report. Um, that was denied. Uh, I was told that's confidential. I said, you know, I said, I said, uh, Diane has permanent brain damage, permanent short-term memory loss, and the response was the same: uh, was that report is still confidential, and to this day, that that still just just irritates the heck out of me. Um, and this was the wall that that typically goes up uh, for too many patients and families uh, when they experience some sort of a very serious uh, medical event in their family to themselves and or to family members. Um, I learned about root cause analysis over the years. And um, I, started, I started really thinking about this. And, and I've given, served on a number of committees. And I've brought, I've brought committees to silence in bringing up this subject and making the recommendation because it's too awkward. And I can just see in their minds, they, they're thinking, I, you know, I'm a nice guy. I was invited to serve in a committee, and here I am making them feel uncomfortable. And um, I have, I have uh, given over 75 patient safety presentations, for, for the most part, to provide your audiences over the last um, now 11 years. 
And my feeling is this, and and if if you want to copy the article and write to me, you, you can get one too. Uh, and it starts there in the third column. I'm just going to read my quote here and then make some other comments. And my feeling is thus, if we truly believe in patient-centered care as well as in transparency, reducing the way too large number of medical errors that cause death and injury, and seeking the input of the person with the most skin in the game, the patient, in the process of the root cause analysis, including investigations and discussions as well as action plans, must involve the patient at the very core of its processes and procedures. Otherwise, we are being disingenuous. Leadership driven by boards, CEOs, physicians, and insurance carriers is central uh, to this happening. Um, involving the patient and the family, um, invite, and I use the word invita inviting as well as involving, but I think the, extent, the invitation needs to be extended. It's not for everybody nor will everybody accept. Um, but it's got to be a part of the culture. Um, participating in the data gathering, discussions, analysis, action plan development. It's the right thing to do. I think it's good business. I think it would also facilitate healing. Um, it's a, it, it enables a, a very crucial information exchange. The, the patient is the one common through, thread uh, throughout their experience and there would be additional learning uh, for all involved. This is a very hot potato, as, as everybody on this call knows. Uh, it's difficult, it's awkward, it's political, and it's complex. Uh, you got the whole power gradient uh, by the clinicians that are involved, but that's not a reason why we should not do it. It's a double negative, but we should be doing it. Um, many hospital attorneys advise against it. State laws impact peer review. Uh, many CEOs and risk managers and others are very reticent, and, and I just mentioned that the clinician power gradient um, and politics play a role. Um, as I mentioned, I've been an outspoken proponent of this for 11 years. I recently retired as a um, healthcare executive search consultant after a number of years of, of consulting and recruiting the very people that I have been trying to reach, and that's board members, CEOs, and others in the C-suite. And we are really, really stubborn about this subject. Uh, I will keep doing this. I know a, a number of others, Jim and I, uh, Jim Conway and I at the national level have, have really, and others, uh, have really been pushing this uh, for some years, but uh, we're, we just, we're just at the tip of the iceberg on this. It's, there's slow change happening. A lot of people are talking about it. When I give presentations, and I've mentioned it in every single one of my presentations, I've promoted it, lots of people will come up afterwards and say, I totally agree with you, but I can't get the powers that be back in my organization to do this. And we've got to reach those powers that be. It doesn't mean that, that um, people uh, down the organization, throughout the organization, frontline staff, uh, pharmacy, whomever, shouldn't be planting this seed, shouldn't be pushing it. The endorsement for it has got to be pushed, supported for, organized at the top, and, and to make sure that it happens um, with the CEO saying to the attorney, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to push back on your resistance to this, but we are going to do this. And uh, we need people who have the courage um, to and the wisdom to do this and, and, really, and really put into action what patient-centered care tr really truly means and what transparency uh, really means. Uh, that's all for now. I can comment more later, Chuck. But uh, as part of, of the response to uh, John's very good presentation, I'm very much in support of, of the uh, concept that he and others, that you and, and others have have been promoting, and um, along with this question I, I saw that originated with Kathy Day. Uh, Kathy, you know, know me well, and I will really push on this as well. I'll be reminding John, but I don't think he needs any, any reminders uh, about this. Uh, ben, that's it's got to start at the top with the board. Fantastic, Dan. And uh, we, we're jumping around in the slides, but your slide set is entirely intact and the transcript you'll be able to tie to. But we want to draw everyone's attention to the Consumers Union prompted 
uh, uh, congressional testimony today, and it was earlier this morning, uh, uh, in a Senate subcommittee, and it was entitled, More Than a Thousand Preventable Deaths a Day is Too Many. And although we've not gone through it completely and carefully because it just ended just prior to uh, us starting our webinar, we'll have that transcript posted on the website for this web page. And there are quotables that you can now use from Congress with your patient safety teams. Uh, Elizabeth Warren was there. Uh, uh, Senator Sanders was there. Uh, the, uh, Dr. James was there, Dr. Ponovos, Dr. Uh, uh, Gandhi, and uh, uh, Dr. Shish Jha. Uh, excellent, excellent testimonies uh, by all of them. And you can use these numbers. Uh, and we were really honored uh, uh, to publish in the Journal of Patient Safety when I was editor-in-chief the article by James that, uh, that is not being challenged uh, uh, to any great degree. So we want to remind you, and the link is at the bottom of this slide, thanks to Jenny Dingman, who's on our, uh, uh, on our uh, advisory board and also uh, a reactor, which who we'll hear from in just a few minutes. So if you look at the bottom of this slide, recorded C-SPAN video, you'll see that link uh, that's available there. And then in the film, Surfing the Healthcare Tsunami, which streams uh, for free uh, from uh, safety leaders, you can also uh, capture content from John uh, uh, Nance. And our article, the Journal of Patient Safety, gave us the uh, opportunity to provide this entire article, uh, which will also be on the, uh, on the website. So when you want to dig down uh, into John's concept of the Red Cover Report and the rationale, the history of the NTSB, I interviewed uh, uh, former leaders of the NTSB, uh, it's all there. So we just want to make sure that you know that you have all the, all, a lot available to you. And so now I'm going to skip, for those of you that are looking at your slides, very quickly before we get to our reactor panel, um, and Dan will be reacting as well, but also content on the Global Patient Safety Forum uh, site uh, is, uh, is up. Uh, and you'll be able to, we did a uh, global summit, and you'll see John Nance there and then other leaders from Cleveland Clinic, Mayo Clinic, Dear uh, Sharon Rosemark from, uh, from Chicago, a wonderful board member, and, and Dan, re really an enormous champion for board. She, I think she's one of the finest uh, trustees uh, in, you know, in, in the United States uh, uh, participating in that. And on slide 41, you can go to a leadership summit that had John Nance and also had, and I'm advancing the slide again, just so you know this is available to you. On slide 42, you see the former head of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT next to John. And then you see a number of advocates, Re Regina Holliday, Mary uh, Foley, um, you see uh, 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 Tricia. Uh, 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 Tori, all on this uh, uh, webinar. Basically, uh, that we went all day long with 30-minute uh, programs, and one of the programs was on the NTSB for healthcare. Um, I'll sum up now before we go to our reaction panel, just to also bring up the five rights of the second victim. So not only is it the patient and family, but it's also our caregivers, and we tend to sequester them uh, as well, get a statement from them and then start to blame them. And you know this issue of vilifying uh, somebody so that we can protect our systems is just a natural phenomenon. And we, can't, we just have to know what occurs. I've seen it personally this year. Uh, and, and the issue is we need to maintain treatment that is just, respect, understanding, and compassion for what goes on when one of our fellow caregivers is involved in a system failure, supportive care, because they're a patient. They're having a psychological emergency, which is different than just loving them, which they need, but supportive medical care. We know that uh, after a bad event, someone is two or three or four more times prone to make a mistake again just because of competence. And then transparency uh, in this process. So the same five rights of the first victim need to be adhered to for the second victim. And we've seen in almost every case uh, when the malpractice attorneys weigh in, they start to find blame with the family because they can reduce the economic cost. And that's where senior leaders need to say, wait a minute, don't do that. And we've actually seen it in almost every case that we've looked at. So the safe practice 
uh, number eight, Care of the Caregiver from the NQF Safe Practices, we w was co-written with uh, uh, with Rick Boothman from the University of Michigan, uh, Dr. Tim uh, McDonald from the University of Illinois, who's now the Chief Safety Officer for the entire university, and a number of risk managers and lawyers helped us with it. And the specifics I won't read to you, but they're in the slides, of what we need to do to make sure that we take care of our own caregivers, and it factors beautifully with the Just Culture work but takes it further because it takes it through the specific actions that an administrator could undertake. And as you know, in our second film, Surfing the Healthcare Tsunami, we used the case of um, Eric Kropp, who was the pharmacist who signed off uh, a piece of paper. Uh, he was supervising uh, a pharmacy technician who created a clear uh, IV fluid that led to the death uh, of this child, Emily Jerry, and uh, we had actually the healing moment when her father, Chris Jerry, in a wonderful, magnanimous way, uh, uh, for, uh, forgave and embraced Eric and told him, it wasn't your fault, it was a system failure, and let's work together to be able to prevent that from happening. So we just want to tie that in to this NTSB or this red cover report that we wrote about. What I'd like to do now is, uh, if Kyle, if you're ready, Becky Martins had a conflict and really wanted to speak, and so we recorded her reaction, and, and I'm asking her a question, and we have two clips. So go ahead, Kyle, if you can, and run Becky uh, before we go to Jennifer Dingman. It's a real pleasure to invite Becky Martins from Maine to comment regarding this whole critical issue. Becky has been a wonderful co-author of papers in the Journal of Patient Safety, a co-author of Chapter 9 of the NQF Safe Practices regarding patient and family engagement, and could not be with us today, but we recorded this message. Uh, Becky, why is it so important that patients and families be involved in the investigations after a medical accident or a system failure that causes harm to a patient or family member? For a patient, all the interactions with staff at all the different junctures, all the little pieces equal the greater sum. The patients and or surviving families have the unique perspective of the whole story. Nearly always, from years of experience supporting patients and their families in their health care journey, when things have gone wrong, nearly always, the patient and or family will say, here is where things began to unravel. When you engage the patient and the family in the investigation, you gain their valuable perspective and lessons learned for quality improvement across your organization, helping you become even stronger. The act of transparency in itself helps the patient and family to begin their journey of healing. When the wrong thing happens, do the right thing. Take care of your patients. Take care of their family. Do not forget about the caregiver. Although our wounds are different, our tears flow the same. We're going to carry the experience with us our entire life. Support us. Help us move through it so we can be whole again. Never doubt the resilience of the human spirit to heal and to forgive. Becky, that was just wonderful. Uh, you also have really often inspired us when you helped us open our webinars and close them with kind of an inspirational and per personal statement regarding these harmful events. Could you share that with us as we, as we close out your section? Hi, uh, thank you, Chuck. When you're near the end of your workday and you're walking out the door, you ask yourself, have I made a difference today? I'd like to leave you with words of affirmation. When you have the right people doing the right things, you get the right results for your patients. You have made a difference. And the result today at your institution, someone is bringing their someone, their everything home. What does that mean for patients and families? It means that our families remain intact. Birthday candles will be blown out. High school graduations will be attended. There will be dance recitals, home runs, new marriages, new babies, presents to be unwrapped. I'd like to thank the team at TMIT, to my fellow patient advocates, and to, and to John Nance, to all of you for your energy, efforts, and resources. Thanks very much, Becky. We really appreciate it.
So um, that was a terrific response from Becky, who's had multiple medical errors in her family and also had a real challenge with the legal system uh, uh, that uh, it, it, so we know that justice uh, healthcare justice is in its infancy infancy and uh, just a terrific uh, proponent there let me shift gears over to Jennifer Dingman followed by Mary Foley to react to what John had said and I think the comments in the Q&A section there are some questions but also some great comments I want to direct your attention there because I'm going to address them and and suggest that you all put up some more questions but I love what we're seeing and so uh, Kyle, let's make sure we can record everybody's Q&A before we shut the webinar down. They're, they're really, really good. Uh, uh, let's go to uh, Jennifer first, and then Mary second, and then we'll go back to Dan. So go ahead, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, Dr. Denham. I am just so ecstatic with today's events. It's such a magical day for healthcare and patient safety beginning the day with these wonderful hearings and our, our politicians and leaders listening to our cause now. It's just wonderful. I really believe that, that John Nance's dream, your dream, and the dreams of others for a National Patient Safety Board will soon be a reality. And I just want to thank everyone here who has contributed to that dream through the years. It's been a dream for me for 18 years. Um, I, today's webinar was so good just the comparative analysis of looking at the National Transportation Safety Board and how they take care of problems and make sure that they don't happen again. We must do this in healthcare. I just went through a really positive experience working with some really great clinicians who looked at each indiv individual case in the particular hospital. My stepmother-in-law went into the hospital a week ago Sunday and she had some severe issues. Rather than just doing some blanket, it, blanket caring for her, they listened to her granddaughter and myself and several other family members, and they kind of went outside of the box, and they delivered the care to her on a personable level, looking at her as person-centered health care. We can no longer look at patients just one way across the board. We, look, we need to look at each individual patient, and we need so much the participation of the families and the friends and the people that are there trying to communicate. On the other hand, we need open-minded clinicians that are willing to listen and think outside of the box and maybe look at something that they might not have thought of to begin with. That's exactly how we are getting to take her home today in a very positive way. Um, I just want to thank my colleagues for their wonderful comments. And Dr. Denham, thank you for your heroic work in patient safety. And just onward and upward from now on, today truly is a blessed and magical day. I'll hand it back to you, Dr. Denham. Well, thanks, thanks, uh, Jenny, and uh, uh, you know, you, Jenny has just been such a just a fierce supporter of uh, quality and safety, and a great advisor to TMIT, and a co-author of uh, the uh, chapter for patient engagement. And you know, Jenny, without your spontaneous and very quick responses to what's going on today with this hearing, we couldn't put the link up uh, that we needed to so that people could watch it. There's a little echo I'm hearing, but thank you, Jenny, for that. So the link to the hearing, which I have been watching, is just terrific, and the audio is good, the video is good, it's great. So, uh, uh, and I think it'll be very helpful, and we'll see if we can download the video so that people then could get sections of it, because you could use it in your organizations. It's very timely. And the story of Dr. James' loss of his son is so tragic and would never have been picked up by trigger tools or other things, as he says in his uh, testimony. Um, Mary Foley is just an awesome uh, contributor to patient safety. She's just there recently. Congratulations to you, uh, Mary, for attaining full professorship, which is enormously challenging at a top organization like uh, UCSF. And, um, She's also building a course in leadership for administrators, so she's very much in the, right in the thick of leadership and really helping uh, uh, inspire and teach uh, people about patient safety and quality. So Mary, take your time and give us uh, your perspective on what you heard today and maybe apply that to the things that you're learning as you're building out this awesome course that you're working on. Thank you, Chuck, and thank you for letting me join you today. And um, all the listeners for your continued participation in this learning network. Um, together we will do better. Um, John is always inspirational and I love his uh, common sense level-headed thinking. 
uh, again, we've learned that it's coming from the aviation industry and some other industries, there are lessons for healthcare. And certainly the concepts of the Red Book and the Blue Book um, afford us something to look at that, you know, really we should take seriously. And, and uh, his unequivocal in enthusiastic and spontaneous support for, and of course patients and families would be involved in the process, just really confirms that there are supporters of, of this work um, across the country and really across the globe. Dan, you, you always did, do an excellent job, and I was um, touched again by your, your story, the difficulties you had, but how it's led you to become such a, an effective advocate. Uh, and you used your executive uh, leadership recruitment to help change the, con the, the complexity of, of boards. You asked them to be more sensitive to patient safety and to consider, as we're learning now, the involvement of patients and families in board decisions and in committees and activities across the, across the whole planning continuum. Um, I, I happen to be coincidentally at a, a safety seminar here in Vermont. I'm looking at a beautiful lake, finished a morning session, which uh, amazing. There is no coincidence in life was on the topic of patients and, and families and how to reconsider how care is planned, delivered, conceptualized, and addressed. Um, and I think, you know, we, we're all trying to be uh, smart providers and at the same time remember that we are patients and we are families. And it was a very moving morning with uh, our, our speakers um, sharing the loss of his sister uh, due to a cancer uh, diagnosis. I shared this week um, my own journey in healthcare last year with my partner who has a lymphoma diagnosis. And I, I presented a, a little video on um, the concept of help us, help you, help us, and how healthcare workers have to be receptive to patients and family questions, concerns, and input. Um, and how I use that as a an example of how I was received as a caregiver. I didn't have the uniform on. I was a nurse, but I was primarily the partner of a very ill woman going through chemotherapy. And I went in every time she was admitted and cleaned the surfaces with gloves. And I have more bleach stains on my clothes, and I'm proud of those stains, um, because I went in and did the cleaning that may have already been done, but may not have been done, because of what we know about the way our system works. And I'm not blaming a housekeeper or a nurse or anyone. I just wanted to take an extra step of precaution. Well, I can tell you, six admissions, I was complimented for helping to participate in the care. And people laughed, and they got me the Clorox wipes. And they, you know, and, and, but they didn't laugh at me. They, they were very kind and said, it's great that you can do something to help Catherine. One nurse said to me on one admission, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing that? We've just cleaned this room. Don't you trust us? And I can tell you, it, if I didn't have just enough conviction to do it, as, as many people would, it, that would have been an terrible, horrifyingly intimidating experience. It may have shut me down as an active caregiver. And it may have made me think twice about the safety of my loved one in that setting. It didn't end up that way. We turned the situation around. I kind of de-escalated her by just, you know, <laughs> being persistent, but also just saying, I really trust everyone. Um, but, you know, trust and then verify. I'm just doing the extra step because that's what Catherine wants me to do, and it's worked every other time. So, you know, it, I think it was so much a learning moment for me to understand what, how healthcare providers receive the, the advice, the input, the criticism, and the question can determine whether we're going to have an effective, successful relationship or not. We have to work in partnership. And, you know, we're, we're teaching that ourselves. We're learning that ourselves every day. And uh, I think we're at a turnaround time, Chuck. I do really believe that there's just an absolute understanding that it has to happen. I think there are a lot of questions and details of how to do it. But those, you know, if the devil is in the details, that means you've already accomplished agreement on, a, on an awful lot of good goals. Um, so let's keep working to, you know, toward those goals. Let's work on the details of how we effectively and meaningfully 
involve patients and families from healthcare planning and primary care uh, all the way through our healthcare continuum to that to end of life decisions. And uh, we will improve this healthcare system uh, one family at a time. Thank you, Barry. And, and what I'm going to do before I go to Dan is make sure to acknowledge these wonderful questions and comments down in the lower right-hand quadrant of your screen. And we'll also be having a poll in just a minute. But I want to acknowledge some of these questions to throw them out to each one of you. And I'll ask each one of you to respond again. And we'll go around the circle. But, uh, but there's some really great comments here. Kathy Day says, what role do you see for patient and family reporting for this idea of the National Healthcare Safety Board? Will the patient and family voice be a part of the board? I think there's absolute unanimous a, 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 a pro, a agreement in that, Kathy. I want to hear that here. We'll go around the table so that Dan can react to some of these as well. Absolutely. D Randy Oster addresses on aircraft carriers and cruise ships, passengers are trained when they board for safety. What role, if any, do you think patients and loved ones should play in protecting themselves uh, and perhaps entering a hospital, a similar process can use, be used for boarding, for onboarding, no question. Want to have you guys uh, as the, the reactors uh, respond to that one as well. Uh, I am 100% in belief that we need to do that. And that's why we did the discovery films. But we really think that institutionalizing onboarding for patients and families is critical. We just shot a bunch of video about ICU, the journey through ICU, and found out that the ICU doctors want, uh, want us to make, have people make sure to get rest while they're in the ICU, that the most dangerous time is the transition from ICU to the floor. And that's when you, you, they really need you as a family member. So very good learning there. Um, Patricia Herko, what is the frequency or hours of simulation training in aviation, is there any work being done to create a standard in healthcare? And the answer there is yes, there are standardized frequency uh, of hours of simulation or flying, uh, flying approaches to, to make, remain, to keep your currency. And it depends on the level. An airline trans transport pilot, an ATP, has a higher level than, let's say, an IFR pilot, which is what I am. Uh, and, but there, there is a regimented standard. And if you go to the NQF Safe Practices, Safe Practice for on Teamwork and Training, we actually built that in as a start. Had a lot of pushback, but we were able to get some of the hours in it. And Jim Bajan, the astronaut, who's also a pilot, uh, helped with that. And then going to Dan, and again, I'll come back to Mary Kowalczyk uh, after Dan, but uh, we'll, we'll ask Dan to comment right now. Great point Dan made on including the family on the board. They're part of the team and crucial. But Dan, do you want to take any one of these issues or react to what you're hearing, this issue that uh, Kathy brought up of, uh, uh, of the family voice, and then uh, Randy about onboarding and, or, or, or for boarding, getting people trained? I will. I, I actually saw this question Kathy had there posed. It was one of the earlier ones, and I wanted to uh, catch John before he left, so that's why I posed it. And, and totally on board, we we got to get the patient and family voice uh, on the board, whether it's one or two or three seats or more. Uh, and we just can't assume, like hospital boards do, that because somebody's on the board that's not a clinician, that they automatically represent the patient's Absolutely. family. Absolutely, not necessarily true. Um, yeah. Randy, your question there about when entering a hospital, a similar process can be used for bordering, for boarding. I think that um, the one thing I can think of at the moment that's that's kind of the the overall protection is to have have somebody there 24/7 with you as an advocate, navigator, whatever term you might want to use. Uh, everybody on this call is a patient or family member at some point. And clinicians particularly know the benefit of having somebody there 24-7 because we all know how, how dangerous a place the hospitals can be at times. Um, I want to make, um, I see a question here from Sherry Loeb about including family on boards. And I just want to point out a very significant person uh, who, who was with the Joint Commission, and that was Sherry's husband, Jared who was one of the strong advocates in this industry for a lot of years about patient safety and quality. He, unfortunately, he passed away from cancer last fall. He was just an absolutely wonderful voice for patient safety, as well as for the patients and the family members, involving, communicating, listening to, uh, et cetera. So, um, Sherry, I don't want to put you on the spot too much but um, uh, and embarrass you, but I don't think you will because I know you're so very, very proud of uh, Jared. Um, I'll take a pass right at the moment on the others and give the others so, a turn. 
great. And uh, uh, so I want to kind of loop back to Jenny in just a moment. But and and I'm going to loop back to Jenny uh, for the reason that she she really helped us with uh, with this uh, with this Senate hearing. And Jenny, in our discussion, and I've moved the slide back to that so that you can again see the link. I think that if we could start a writing campaign from this webinar, and and just to give you some insights the hacks, the hospital-acquired condition work, and other patient safety work, the folks that you hear on this phone call actively wrote, let, wrote letters. And, and my team put together the evidence-based arguments for a number of the things that we really felt were important to, to get through the system. And it were, if it hadn't been for Jenny and Mary and Dan and, and a whole network of colleagues writing in letters that actually were registered and that people saw, and they really do count them, uh, certain things would have not gone through. And I think, uh, Jenny, I just want you to, uh, to, to just say what you did publicly uh, or privately is that this hearing is important, but now we need to write letters. If you've got an opinion regarding what needs to be done, every voice counts. They count them and they, and they look at them on, on, a, on, a, on a grid, and sometimes the voice of an individual is almost as, as, as important to them as, as a letter from an organization. So, so Jenny, would you, do you want to kind of uh, put the slide back up? Do, are we in agreement that we really should follow up on this wonderful hearing with, uh, with letters and emails to, our, to, our, uh, to, our, to the politicians and those specifically in the hearing? Oh, absolutely, Dr. Denham. Actually, I ha we've already started some of uh, my colleagues here at Pulse in making some phone calls to the committee members that can be found if you go to um, the website, for the government website, the subcommittee members, their names are all listed. And they can be reached either by email or snail mail or fax. And you can also call and leave your comments for each of them and encourage them with this and hope that we have future hearings to create a National Patient Safety Board. And the telephone number is 202-224-3121. Again, 202-224-3121. And everyone, I strongly encourage you, if you're in favor of this, to please call today and thank them for what they've done and encourage others to do so because this is huge and this is something that we really must address as soon as possible. I also wanted to mention that it was talked about that patients and families need to be um, more involved and they were also talking about boards um, you know, and uh, CEOs being the ones that are backing all of this patient safety agenda stuff and it really needs to start there in each and every hospital and I just want to commend TMIT for bringing that up to begin with. I, I can't thank you enough and thank everyone on this call for being here today. I think we're really on a roll now and great things are coming. Thanks, Dr. Denham. Well, gr great, Jenny. And, I, and um, so I was invited to be in a debate. It, I didn't realize it was going to turn out to be a debate at the American Society of Anesthesiology because I got to do their opening keynote. And the next day, they had me on a panel. I didn't realize that they wanted it to be a debate. I pulled out our NTSB article because at the last minute, they said it was going to be a debate. And I, since I had written it, I really knew it very well. And the other guys were so busy that I did more of the, 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 the word tooling of the article so I could go right back to the sections uh, and we had a debate about an NTSB for healthcare uh, with the anesthesiologist and the, at the end uh, it became clear that everyone was in support of such an, a thing but no one knew how to fund it so it was not that it wasn't a good idea it was how it could get resourced I'm going to go to Mary Kowalczyk, and hopefully I've pronounced your name correctly, uh, Mary. And she said, states, until the government puts an agency like an, a, identical to the NTSB in place and functions that way, uh, uh, with the need to investigate all events at some level, we will not get the results that the transportation uh, uh, industry has. And uh, how do we get healthcare to do that? I think the end of her question was uh, cut off. And the second one that she stated was, how do you get healthcare report events? NTF, NTSB knows that there's a crash from the news, but a healthcare board would be dependent on house hospitals. And that's where I think we really need a public service approach to get all families and anybody uh, out there that interacts with the healthcare system to start reporting things and reporting them to the state health department. There's no money that's been put behind this, but when we can get complaints registered, those potentially could go to such a, such a board. The problem is the, the, the errors of omission 
uh, like Dr. James said in his testimony in the death of his son, we can see commission. Omission is so much harder to find, and that's where I think those of us in the healthcare system, and I put up the ARC report of the 600,000 staff that were interviewed at 1,100 hospitals. 37% uh, believe that, uh, that they're, of the 37% will not report an error uh, as it's happening. Well, that's terrible. If in aviation, if we thought an error was happening, and sometimes that does, just look at the slide. 37% will not report a potential error. Two-thirds believe that mistakes will be held against them. And the rest of the data of this enormously important ARC report uh, 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 is up. Very, very critical. And the link is at the bottom of the page. And the press didn't pick it up for some reason, which is just really, really strange. Uh, but Kathy Day also states, why would anyone think it's OK to have a secretive investigation into an incident that caused harm? It's exactly what happens in most cases. Um, Another question Carson Ralphs asked is, what are some of the barriers to instituting an, NT, an NHSD quickly? We really analyze that, and it is really all about resourcing money and then the political barriers that certain groups in power will put up until they start to realize that it's going to save them money. And so like anything, it's going to really take that approach. I'd like to go back to uh, uh, Mary because of how knowledgeable you are having been you know, you've been the president of the American Nurses Association. You're high, at a high level in academics, but you've had errors and harm in your own family. And m m do you want to react to some of these great questions and comments that these folks have uh, have put up? Well, I just think it's uh, the wisdom of the crowd, um, Chuck, that we have folks asking the, the kinds of questions, and we all need to be uh, good at prodding. Um, Jetty, thank you for the link to the Senate hearing, and you know, please take her seriously. We need to express support for this. Uh, to it, for first of all, for attention to these kinds of issues. These are the real bread and butter, life and death issues of people in the U.S. And we want our elected leaders to pay attention to these kinds of issues and and get some results. So we need to thank those committee members and applaud the work. But that you know, one hearing is just one hearing. So there has to be follow-up to it, recommendations that are specific, and then, you know, support for it. And we're not, you know, this is not a political statement. This is a public and safety advocacy statement. So I, I think, Chuck, you've got a lot of people on board um, who are, you know, really uh, answering the call for involved, deep involvement, deep and meaningful involvement, and are, are ready and willing um, to organize to, to make sure we we give care better, um, and that the patients and families are safe, and the healthcare providers who really want to do their best are enabled to do their best, and that they're, that the systems are improved so that they can focus their attention on giving quality and safe care, because no one goes to work in the morning hoping to do a bad job, not a single person, um, unless they're a criminal. If they're a criminal, there are, are entirely different issues and avenues to address that. But the average person committing uh, the average error, unfortunately, uh, leads to horrible consequences. And that's not what most people intend to do when they start their day. So I, I, just, I just think we've got the energy now, Chuck. Let's use it. Great. I want to draw your attention before we have people drop off. And we'll come back to some of what, more of these questions. But we just have two pages of polling questions. And I want to make sure everybody understands them. If we had 25 NTSB-like red cover reports, not a report on the hundreds of thousands, in fact, probably millions of harms that occur per year, but if we had 25 per year on the most common healthcare accidents, the things that happen over and over and over again that everybody is scared to death about, uh, the, the, the most common misdiagnoses, the most common things that you are plagued with as a safety or quality officer that could either be a report of one that happened or an aggregate report of two or three that are blinded so that you're not pointing at an institution, but that, that really have the essence of what's happening every single day. If you could get 25 such reports that you could use at your organization, uh, how important that would, would that be to you? That, and we want a declarative statement. That would help me. Uh, give it a 10 if you strongly agree that you've got 25 of the most common accidents you're scared to death about so that you could see the multi-causal uh, issues and how they play together. That's the first question. The second question is, I need the harm 
tied to predictive analytics so that I can predict our organization's risk. So that what, what we're basically saying is it's one thing to have the report and know what the culprit processes are in the system failure, to know that here's where, here's where the breakdown was, here's where another breakdown was, here's where the cascade of events caused this accident to occur. But if you were given predictive analytics that really allowed you to look at your numbers and say, well, what are the odds that this is going to happen in our organization tied to the number of discharges, number of surgeries, number of admissions, et cetera? Would that be of help to you or not? A 10 is strongly agree. A 1 is very strongly disagree. And then the third question is, we need more learning and practical tools for care of the caregiver. I want to give generous time on the NTSB issue, but this care of the caregiver is being left by the wayside. And when we see this ARC report, and things really haven't changed, people are scared to death to bring up an issue because they know that the system is going to send antibodies their way and make life tough for them, and instead they go home at night feeling terrible that they haven't addressed it. And Edmund Burke said that that evil triumphs when good men do nothing. So, but many of us go to bed at night thinking, gosh, you know, if only I could voice my opinion, but we let, again, we, you know, we basically vilify uh, the patients, vilify our own caregivers in order to protect the systems that pay our paycheck. And the final two questions, and now we'll go back to our panel, the final two questions are the topics or healthcare events for which we need NTSB-like reports are. Are they medication errors? Are they pre preventative uh, healthcare-associated infections? Are they misdiagnoses? Are they wrong site surgeries? Are they the never events? Just go ahead and give us the list that you really would love to see. And then the topics, uh, and so these are the event type of events. And then the second question is about the drill down topics. Is it communication that you want to see? Are they process issues? Do you want to see health IT issues being addressed? What, ca what categories or elements would you like in a typical NTSB report? So the first question is, what kind of accidents? And the second question, and we probably could have worded it a little bit better, I, you know, I was my wording, was what are the topics or the elements of a, of a report that you would like to see so we can take this to the next, uh, to the next level? So I, I'd like to go back to Dan. Dan, uh, you, you always have great uh, additional comments uh, you know, to add. Uh, are there others that you'd like to add? Um, the, the one thing that comes to mind as I've been listening is, is, is we, this will not take the place of a root cause analysis. Um, hospitals can't sit back and say, well, we escaped that bullet because we now got this thing that's going to happen at the national level. Uh, given just the numbers we've been talking about, we, we will have a continued need uh, for the root cause analysis and a continued need to invite the patient and the family to uh, participate. Um, there was one question in there, and Chuck, and I can't remember who said it, but mentioned something about uh, does something about does not the Joint Commission Sentinel events uh, process with that, which in the Joint Commission being the quasi uh, public, I can't remember the terminology, but I think I think probably in fairness to the Joint Commission, uh, I don't think the current structure of the Joint Commission enables it to be as independent as as this national and board could be. Joint Commission doesn't promise um, to make anything public. It feeds everything back to the organization. It doesn't pull punches. I know the Joint Commission has received a lot of criticism from a lot of people because it can't be more public. But in its own structure and its own mission, it doesn't say that it will be. But I think I think I think if I understand this this uh, National Transportation Safety Board like structure uh, would enable more independence and more objectivity. Great, great. Looping back to uh, uh, Jenny, uh, you, you've recently uh, now one of our teammates who is with us, uh, who has been very, very supportive, is uh, has been Arlene uh, Salamandra, uh, who has had her own very difficult experience in nursing homes and uh, uh, and the fact that this is a, a big problem not only in hospitals 
but it's a big problem in the 17,000 nursing homes that we uh, that, that serve our country and uh, really don't have the uh, CPOE systems and EHR systems. It turns out that they're they they are not they don't have the same requirements uh, that the hospitals do, and yet we have to send patients to them. And the most difficult time is the, that transition from a hospital to a nursing home. And we know that we've got a real leadership vacuum in the nursing homes. Uh, Jenny, do you want to kind of comment because we have had many discussions with Arlene to have her voice heard. Uh, yeah, it's that sort of about bullying. Um, through the years, uh, the folks at Pulse, the organization that I, I co-founded, um, have heard from many, many clinicians who are fit to be tied because they see things that they don't feel are appropriate. But when they try to do something about it, it's unfortunate that they get bullied and treated poorly by other clinicians and, and of course, supervisors. So that kind of keeps our, our culture of silence with regard to trying to make positive changes. What we really need to do, what we encourage patients and families to do is when we have nurses that think out of the box somewhat like with the description of the situation I just experienced, a real positive one, we need to commend these people and we need to show CEOs and boards that the public and the patients and families really appreciate nurses who will go to bat for a patient. Um, on the other side of the coin, we have absolutely no support system for clinicians within our hospitals. We don't have any types of meetings that are kind of standard across the board to help hold these people up where they can just go and vent their um, you know, energies and, and, and talk about things without fear of retribution. We need to find a way to maybe have um, you know, meetings where people can go after work and just voluntarily share information with one another and hold each other up so then they can come to work the next day, refresh, they can sleep better at night. I think that would cut a lot of uh, problems that we have now in the system with regard to substance abuse because people are so frustrated. With regard to the bullying issue, I think healthcare needs to lead the way in this country with anti-bullying standards. And I think that this is a great place to start. I think we should all really let our thoughts be known to the people who are going to create this National Patient Safety Board and make this a huge issue. Arlene has worked tirelessly on this, and, and she's a great leader. And I would strongly recommend that anyone who has questions about this, please uh, go to Dr. Denham and TMIT for contact information for Arlene. Thanks for bringing this up, Dr. Denham. Great, great. Well, I'd like to uh, I, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, a, a terrific uh, webinar. I'd like to go one more time around the loop to just see if there are any last minute uh, issues or questions that uh, uh, that we want to bring up. And I want to remind everyone, uh, and Dan will allow you to close us. But uh, I want to remind everyone to go and watch this uh, webinar. And I'm going to put it back up uh, again. This uh, this hearing, uh, I've heard a lot of hearings. You would be very proud of what uh, our leaders in healthcare said. Uh, you heard a lot of interest by Elizabeth Warren, who's the new senator in Massachusetts. Regardless of your political persuasion, uh, the, she, she had a very instrumental role in helping improve the banking system. Whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a financial consumer. And uh, she had an enormous impact on trying to bring clarity and transparency to uh, abuses uh, in the finance area where people couldn't uh, speak truth to power and some mechanisms were put into place because of uh, her attention to that detail and and, uh, and and is very well respected at, at Harvard and has uh, I think done a, a terrific job again regardless of political persuasion um, uh, it, but I would remind everybody go listen to this hearing we're, what we're going to do is uh, make sure that they're going to keep it up on C-SPAN for some time. If they're not, find out how we can get a copy of it and get it. If it's not up at YouTube on YouTube, get it up on YouTube so everyone can hear it. And then uh, see if there's a way that uh, you all can then acquire clips because you, you could hear some very, very thoughtful responses and a very, very good introduction to the issue. So when if you're pushing yourself against some power at your organization on the numbers. You know, when Congress starts to quote numbers like 440,000 and they start to get a, a former NASA scientist who's lost a son to talk about uh, handoff information and in, instruction to patients after they left, and the fact that his son's death would not have been prevented or caught 
by the tools that we use for incident reporting, you start to realize that we're only talking about the tip of the iceberg. And I thought Ajit's job made a great statement to say that the numbers that we, that, that when the 1999 report came, came out, and everyone has that first slide in their deck with 98,000 lives, that the number is enormous, it's much bigger, and that we haven't moved the needle. And this is in Ajit's, uh, I don't want to misquote him, but you listen to what he says, and he actually uh, addresses uh, you know this issue. So uh, uh, what I'd like to do is, is uh, we're now right on time. Um, I'd like to turn it back to uh, to uh, Dan Ford and have Dan close us as you've opened us. And I just want to thank everybody for their contribution and for taking the time to be uh, on board with this. We'll put the links, we'll put the articles, and make everything available to you on the page that you usually go to. So Dan, would you please close us? And we'll allow this, ask the speakers to stay on at the end just so that we can uh, uh, do a, a process improvement loop to see if there's anything we could have done better. I uh, appreciate, uh, thank you, Chuck. I appreciate uh, everybody's involvement today. This has been a very rich conversation with, with John at the heart of this, John Nance. Um, he's, uh, as, as you could tell, he's, some of the words I used, I hope, I hope that came through. And if you get to know him, uh, in your own ways, uh, including by reading his books. Um, um, I would encourage that you do that. One of the quotes that I got from his latest book charting, called Charting the Course, which he and Kathleen Bartholomew, who is his wife, uh, wrote, uh, she's a nurse leader and a, and a consultant. And uh, it's, again, it's a very practical book. He, he has a quote in there that I really think is, uh, has a lot of substance. Uh, and I quote, the first accountability of a leader is to know reality. And he quotes Max Dupree, who was the founder of Herman Miller and a writer and uh, just a very thoughtful person. Um, I would suggest that the, uh, going back to the patient and the family, that the, that, and I mentioned, as I mentioned in my article, the, the one person with the full skin in the game is the patient. And the patient really understands the reality. And I would promote the idea of the patient also as a leader in what you're doing uh, in terms of that the partnership with the patient. I would encourage you to involve patients for their input and, uh, and, and consider them as leaders as well. Again, thank you for, for all of you for your participation. Well, great. And, and uh, so God bless you. Have a wonderful month. Next month we have the former leader of the nursing homes in America, uh, Alice Bonner, uh, who reports to, uh, reported to Thomas Hamilton at CMS. Uh, before leaving, and uh, she is a wonderful and talented and a great speaker who will address the issue of this transition from acute care to nursing homes and a lot of the specifics uh, with really, really great data on how we can improve the care continuum. And as we move towards population management and ACOs, we're going to be responsible for that continuum uh, as uh, our seniors move into nursing homes and our acute care patients make a stop in the skilled nursing facilities on their way home. So uh, take care. Have a great, uh, great day, and thank you all.